Thank you for searching us out on the internet at this time. It's a joy and a privilege to be able to bring to you the Word of God and to present the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever you're watching from, you're very welcome indeed. I want to bow just in a word of prayer before I read to you the Scriptures. Our Father and our God, we come into thy presence in the holy and worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ, coming before thy face, the face of the living and the holy and the true God. We thank thee for the opportunity of bowing in thy courts. We thank thee that thou hast made the way whereby guilty sinners are able to approach a holy and a righteous God. We thank thee, O God, for the way of access then that is ours in and through the Lord Jesus Christ who is the one mediator between God and men. He is the man Christ Jesus. And Father, I bless thee for the privilege then of being able to present the word of God. Thank thee for the joy that we have in having the scriptures of truth. And we thank thee for thy wisdom and for thy grace and love towards mankind in that thou hast given unto us thy holy word, revealing unto us the mind of God and the Lord's will. And Father, we pray that as we come to look into the scriptures that thou in thy grace and mercy will speak to our hearts. The preparation of the heart belongeth unto the Lord. And so we desire that thou wilt prepare every heart just now. And as the word of God goes forth, may it be proclaimed in the power and demonstration of God the Holy Ghost. Answer our prayers. Continue with us now, and may uh, this recording be a blessing to a great many. For the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Our Bible reading uh, for this message is taken from the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 3. Firstly, we'll read a few verses beginning at verse 14, and then there's one verse in Joshua chapter 4. And so we'll read firstly from Joshua chapter 3, and we're commencing to read at the verse 14. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, that is, beside Zeratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. And there's one verse then in chapter 4, the verse 10. For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people, according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. Amen. And I trust that the Lord will bless the reading of his word to your heart for Jesus' sake. I'm delighted to have a message in song that uh, Miss Charlotte Cahy from Portobogie Free Presbyterian Church has recorded for us to use tonight. And the piece that she's going to sing to us now is entitled, How Deep the Father's Love.
really appreciate Charlotte's help and contribution to the meeting. It's my prayer and desire that uh, her ministry and song will be a blessing to your heart and that the Lord will bless her and her family in days to come. And I'd like to turn you now to the Word of God and to the ministry of God's Word. And I want to use as a text a, a few words that appear at the end of verse 10 of Joshua chapter 4. And Joshua 4 verse 10 says, For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people. According to all that Moses commanded Joshua, and the people hasted and passed over. And it's those final few words of that verse 10 that I'd like to bring before you in the gospel tonight. The people hasted and passed over. They hasted and passed over the river Jordan. And that river Jordan finds its source at the base of Mount Hermon, just to the north of the land of Israel. And really, the Jordan begins as four smaller rivers, which all merge together. And they commence a journey then of over 150 miles, firstly into the Sea of Galilee at its northern tip. And then out again at a southerly point on the Sea of Galilee. And eventually those waters make their way to the Dead Sea. For around 75 miles towards the end of its journey, as it meanders like a giant snake, the Jordan is flowing well below sea level, making it the lowest river upon earth. With its history and its location, it attracts millions of visitors every year from all over the world. However, the two million people who stood on its banks in our scripture reading weren't there on a sightseeing expedition. For them, the Jordan was going to provide a gateway to a new life that many of them had looked forward to for 40 years and more. But as they stood at the water's edge, the river also presented them with a problem. How were they going to get across? The more elderly, the very young, mothers with babes in arms, the lame, the sick, the blind. What families as well as individuals were going to do to get across this river, which at the time was overflowing its banks, presented them with a great difficulty and problem. Perhaps some of them wondered how it would be possible for such a vast array of people to safely traverse this watery obstacle. However, our text says that the people hasted and passed over. I want to use this text tonight to preach the gospel to you, emphasizing to you the necessity of taking the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. And in relation to these matters before us, I would highlight to you that this passing was a defining moment in the existence of each individual present. Forty years some of them had wandered in the wilderness. If you discount Joshua and Caleb, many of the others were only teenagers when they had left the land of Egypt. The Bible tells us in another place in Joshua that all those over the age of 20 at the Passover in Egypt had died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And so, for most of their lives, those who had been teenagers in Egypt had been nomads, wanderers. Others who stood on the banks of the Jordan that day had been born in the wilderness. And so, they had known nothing else but wandering. But this was the day that they had dreamed of. When they came to leave the hot, sandy, inhospitable desert and enter into a land that the Lord had told them was flowing with milk and honey, where they would have houses and farms and stability and somewhere to call home. This potentially was the best day of their lives. And that's what coming to Christ is. It's the defining moment in a person's existence. 
when their sins are forgiven, the aimless life of pleasure seeking comes to an end, when they're fitted for heaven and granted eternal life. I might be speaking to you tonight and you've had many high points in your life up until this moment in time. You have many days that you look back upon with eminent joy and pride. But what about the day of conversion? Have you experienced such a day as this? Or are you still in your sin? That's the question I would like you to think about just now. I'm delighted to have you listening to the gospel. But in reality, I want you to do more than merely listen. I want you to think about what I'm saying and the appeal that I'm making tonight to your soul. Perhaps you listened last week to the message that was preached, but listening hasn't done you any good because you haven't acted as yet upon what you've heard. In a strange way, the devil doesn't mind you listening to the gospel as long as you don't act upon what you hear. In this defining moment, the Bible says that these people hasted and they passed over. They did something. And that says to me in the second place tonight that they made a decision. They made a decision. Because this was not only a defining moment for them, it was also a moment for decision. And could I suggest to you that in the primary place then in relation to this decision, that it was a positive decision. Because the Israelites on this occasion decided that they would go forward and they would cross the Jordan. They had wandered in the wilderness for long enough. It was now time for them to make a fresh start. They might have decided to turn their backs and, and walk away into the wilderness of wandering again. There's many a person does that when it comes to salvation. They turn their back upon Christ. Remember the man described in the Gospels as the rich young ruler. We read in Mark chapter 18 and the verse 17 that he comes firstly running to the Saviour. If you had been a bystander that day and had witnessed this young man running to get to Christ, you would have said to yourself, well, here's a candidate for salvation. Look at him come. Look how anxious he is to get to the Saviour. And the young man then speaks and he says to the Lord Jesus, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And again, a bystander would have been impressed with these words. They'd have said, here's someone who's going to heaven, surely. They're interested in eternal life. And perhaps some preachers at that point would have produced a little card for him to sign and said to themselves, well, there's another convert in my ministry. But that's not how the Saviour worked. No, Christ responds to the young man's apparent zeal by saying, there is none good but God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not fear, bear false witness. Defraud not. Honour thy father and thy mother. But what did the young man say in response? To that statement of Christ. He said master. All these things have I observed from my youth. And in saying those words. He immediately contradicts what the Lord has said. Because Christ maintained there is none good. But the young man says in effect I'm good. I haven't broken one of these commandments. In other words. The young man was saying, I'm good enough to get to heaven. He was self-righteous. He didn't want to take the sinner's place. And the Bible tells us that the Lord loved him. Because the Lord loves sinners. And the Lord loves you. And in effect, the Lord Jesus went on to say, even 
if you're as good as you say you are, you're still not good enough to get to heaven. Here's something else that you should do. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, take up the cross and follow me. And the word of God states in Mark chapter 10 and the verse 22 that the young man went away grieved. He didn't want to admit his sin. He didn't want to repent. He wanted salvation on his terms. And so he turned his back upon Christ. He made a decision. But it was the wrong decision. The worst decision of his life. And how tragic it would be if someone listening to this message should walk away from the Saviour tonight and lose their soul at the last. The people in Joshua chapter 4 and verse 10 made a positive decision. Once more, I would suggest to you that they made a prompt decision because the Bible says that they hasted. They didn't linger or dilly-dally or stand with their finger in their mouth wondering, will I or won't I? Now, of course, not every hasty decision is a good decision. The world currently is going mad after tattoos. You walk down the street when the towns are open up again, and statistics tells us that around one person in every five over the age of 18 that you will meet will have a tattoo somewhere on their body. And the majority of those who get tattoos do so after thinking about it for only about two or three days. Many of them just do it on the spur of the moment. And before the ink has properly dried and the pain subsided, they regret what they have done. We're also told that a sizable number get a tattoo of the name of their boyfriend or girlfriend, wife or husband, only to fall out with them a short time afterward. And so someone has adapted the old saying now to say, tattoo with haste, repent at leisure. But as these people stand on the brink of the Jordan, they have a hasty decision to make. Do I go? Or do I not go? Maybe that's what's going through your mind just now in regard to salvation. Will I get saved tonight or will I not get saved tonight? Will I follow Christ just now or will I turn my back upon him? And yet though this was a hasty or a prompt decision that these people had to make. It wasn't a reckless decision. Not like the individual stepping in off the street to get some sort of an inking done on their body that they will regret perhaps within a day or two or a week or two of having got it done. No, this wasn't a reckless decision that these people made to go into the Jordan and eventually go to the land of Canaan. This was a decision that was based, though it was prompt, yet it was based upon the promise of the Lord. Because the Lord had for many a long day promised that he would bring the children of Israel to this point where they would stand and prepare to enter into the promised land. That promise had been made to Abraham hundreds of years before. Because, for example, the Lord had said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and the verse 1, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And in verse 7 of that same Genesis 12, whenever Abraham came into the land of Canaan, the Lord, the Bible says, appeared unto him and said, Unto thy seed 
will I give this land, the land of Canaan. And now all these centuries of years later, the Lord is fulfilling the promise that he made to Abraham. And so it is in relation to salvation and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the promise of a saviour for your soul was given many hundreds of years ago. Indeed, it was first given whenever man sinned in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3 and the verse 15, the Lord said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, speaking to the devil, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And the Lord there was speaking of Jesus Christ. A promise that, thank God, has never been rescinded. A promise that was seen in its fulfillment by Jesus Christ going to the cross to die. And that's the promise upon which I can offer you salvation tonight. Because eternal deity took upon him perfect humanity to reconcile sinners like you and I to a holy God. Christ is the long promised one. And he is the one who is able to save your soul. And so these people, they step forward. And they crossed the Jordan and they entered in to this promised land upon the basis of this promise that had been given to them in the person of their forefather Abraham and to many others before them many years before. This hasty decision was not a reckless decision again. Because it was based not only upon the promise of God, it was also based upon the pro pronouncement of God. Because in Joshua chapter 1 and the verse 2, the Lord had said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all the, this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. The Lord commanded them to cross the Jordan. That's why they must haste. They must haste to obey the Lord's commandment. And the Lord commands you tonight to take the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. He now, the Bible says, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And you should take Christ therefore now. You've waited long enough and debated long enough. Don't stand wondering whether you should receive the Saviour or reject the Saviour anymore. Come to him just now. As the Spirit of God speaks to your heart and shows you your need. And speaks to you of the, the brevity of life. And the need of a saviour for eternity. And finally though this had to be a hasty decision that these people made. In Joshua chapter 4 and the verse 10. It wasn't reckless. Because of the provision of the Lord. The waters of Jordan of course opened up. Joshua chapter 3 and the verse 17 says that. Every one who crossed that river did so on dry ground. As soon as the feet of the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant came to the edge of the river, the waters ceased to flow and the ground dried and the way was opened up. The key to this miracle was the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. And the ark is, of course, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ark was made of wood overlaid with gold, representing the humanity and the deity of Christ. The ark contained the Ten Commandments, representing the Lord Jesus 
in his perfect keeping of the law of God on behalf of his people. The ark housed some of the manna, showing how Christ satisfies the soul of the trusting believer. The ark had Aaron's rod that budded with almonds, the first fruit in Israel to bud. There's a picture of new life in Christ. And the ark was lifted up. It was on the shoulders of the priests. And so Christ was lifted up upon the cross. A spectacle of woe, a spectacle of shame, bearing the judgment and the wrath of God. I'd like you to picture the scene. Two million people filing across this river, dried up riverbed, standing in the midst of that riverbed are these priests bearing this ark, upholding this ark, the picture of Jesus Christ. And maybe as some of those people stepped down into the depths of the, the dried up river, they tremble. They tremble. Maybe they looked at the vast wall of water and became frightened of it tumbling in upon them. But when they feared, when they trembled, all they had to do was look at the ark because it was their assurance. While the ark remained, the waters were stayed. And you know something? Many a soul has come to Christ trembling. Trembling, some of them under the weight of their sin. Others trembling that they couldn't keep their salvation. Some trembling because of some impending trouble that has driven them to Christ and brought them to an end of themselves. Oh, dear friend, don't be afraid of trembling your way to the cross. Even though your faith might seem weak, yet come to him and receive him. Because Christ has performed all the work that's needed for your salvation. All you have to do is come, make the decision, take the step. And this will become the defining moment of your existence. I trust that the Lord will help you to come tonight if you haven't already received him as Saviour. I trust that the Lord will bless his word to your heart tonight and make this the defining day of your existence. Because this is the day when you take that step of faith and that step towards Christ and receive him as your saviour. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word and for the grand message of the gospel. We thank thee that Jesus saves. And O oh God, our Father, we pray that thou wilt bless the holy truth of thy word to our hearts. We are undeserving of the least of the Lord's mercies, as undeserving as those Israelites were of the land of Canaan. And yet, O oh God, in grace, thou didst bring them to that place where they entered into the land. O oh, may there be an entering into Christ tonight, a receiving of him, a trusting upon his finished work, a dependence upon the promises of God and grant, O oh God, that thou in thy grace and mercy there will so convict some of their need that they will be drawn irresistibly to Jesus Christ. And so remember thy word, separate us in thy fear and may the blessing of the Lord rest upon us in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. May I say, if you'd like to become a child of God, a Christian, you think I could be of any 
help or assistance to you, please contact me. I would be delighted to open up the word of God with you. And I trust that the Lord will be with you then. Watch over you and keep you. For the Lord's sake. Amen.